Jake here. In this episode, I interview Dylan Tellum. He is currently a co-owner and product developer with AbMap, which has evolved tremendously since he's been involved. His story is absolutely fascinating. He took a chance on himself and went all in with his first invention, the Ab Amigo. It was extremely risky, but with a ton of grit and a little luck, it ultimately led him to where he is today. In this chat, we discuss his story, what's going on with AbMat these days, American manufacturing, his pitch to a company selling a knockoff product, the future of the industry, and more. All right, let's go. Hey Dylan, how's it going? Pretty good, brother, how you doing? Oh, I cannot complain. Um, so it was about three years ago, we first met through the internet. Do you remember that? I do. I do. It was about 30,000 followers ago when I was still pushing the Abamigo username with under a thousand followers and you were somewhere around 30 and you were the first uh, influencer to give me the time of day. So I'm, I'm, I'm still grateful for that, by the way. I wasn't at the time, I wasn't really talking to a ton of other people either. I feel like that was still in the early days for me too. Um, I went through our DMs and I simply shot you a message that said, hey, cool product in regards to the Ab Amigo. Mm. And you offered to make a trade for a Garage Gym Experiment flag. So we did a little trade. Um, we did some cross promotions. So that was, a, that was a few years after you had first thought of the Ab Amigo, correct? Yeah, that was in 2018, I believe. The Ab Amigo was invented on 2004. Uh, I'm sorry, 2016 on October 4th. Very cool. Um, could you could you go into how you first thought of the idea and then the following steps? So the Ab Amigo was never meant to be a product, right? I was doing some push-ups and sit-ups in the morning while I was living in Vermont. My plan was to get in shape, move back to Miami and impress the ladies, right? So I'm doing 50 sit-ups every day and, and I got to, it was October 3rd, I got to 49 out of 50 while using the dresser that was in this apartment that we were renting uh, to hold my feet down, right? The little gap underneath. And I got to 49 out of 50. I heard a loud crack. The, the bottom of the dresser had just broken off. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, shit, what am I going to do now? So I wake up the next day planning on doing my little fitness routine. I can't find anywhere to hold my feet down. I tuck them under the bed that was sitting on the floor. You just using a mattress. And I tried all these other things. It was hurting my feet. And I said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to have to go to Home Depot. I got to fix this dresser anyways. I'm going to build something, right? So I got my 90-year-old grandfather in the car who was a machinist, and we went to Home Depot, and I told him that we were there to make a project, you know, to help me out with doing my sit-ups in the morning. And when we got there, he was a little confused. He said, "What? listen, what are we trying to build? I don't know exactly what you're picturing here. So I grabbed a couple of roofing angles. I grabbed a piece of wood, and I grabbed some foam that they use to uh, insulate gutters on barns. And I kind of put them all together. I said, this is, so I'm looking for something like this, but I need to bend these. And I was like, you know what? These will actually work. So all the materials that I had gotten to explain what I was trying to build were ironically the perfect things that I needed within the Home Depot. So I buy all these different products from Home Depot that were meant for random things. And I go back to my uh, apartment in Vermont and I found a brick at the bottom of a river that I used to put into one, one of these vices and with blowtorch, I torched up these roofing angles, bound them over with the brick, and I bent my first uh, legs for these Ab Amigos. And I made this product that slid underneath my bed and held my feet down for doing sit-ups. You know, it was a real simple device. And um, I was playing around with it after I did my 50. I started going around the room trying to think of where else can I put this thing, you know? And I slid it underneath the door and it held perfectly. And my brother came walking down the stairs and he said, where'd you get that? I said, I made it. I said, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. I said, you should sell that. And I went, huh. All right. At that point in time, I decided, you know what? I'm going to do anything in my power, no matter what I need to do to make sure I see this product to market. I made it my definite purpose. And it was a very long journey with a lot of trials and tribulations, uh, you know, from 2016 well, it was the end of 2016 right so it was about another year until i actually started getting it to the point where i can market it mm -hmm. uh, you know we had i learned from the people that had come before me and i realized i needed to get a patent right 
I'm 19 years old living in my aunt's basement in Vermont. How do you pay for a patent? You know, <laughs> I get I got two different attorneys and two or three of them told me, oh, well, you can, you know, you could pay whatever you like for a patent. I said, oh, what do you mean? You can't give me a, a number of what this is going to cost? You go, no, <laughs> just it's, it's going to cost what it costs. And I was like, great. So I put together all every bit of penny, every penny that I had, sold my coin collection, my stamp collection, all of my investments and uh, wrangled up $8,000, got a provisional patent together. And um, after I had that filed, I, I started getting to work, right? So at that point, I had no money whatsoever. Uh, I borrowed $2,000 from my brother and I got a loan in my mom's car, actually. With, with her permission, of course. And uh, I got uh, I got another six or seven grand and uh, I started developing the product, you know, buying parts and starting a website and getting photos and videos and all that jazz. And it was not working out, but uh, <laughs> when I'm 15 grand in, nobody, <sighs> nobody's buying the product. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, you're all in on this one. I was, I was gonna I was gonna ask your 14 15 grand is it you're all you're all in or is it, it's time to give up no yeah this this was I'm almost all in right I was holding on to one thing which was this truck that I was building since I was 16 a ground up restoration of a 1978 Ford F-150 a truck I bought in Georgia for $500 and I'd put about $30,000 into restoring it it was beautiful but uh I was between keep the truck and finish it and move on with your merry life or sell the truck and go 100% all it. I made a split second decision. I listed the truck that day for 10 grand just to get it out. And because uh, I needed, because I needed eight and uh -huh. I sold the truck within two hours and uh, I never looked back. Man. It was, uh, it was, it, it was the leap of faith of knowing that I was 100% in at that time. I had no assets. I liquidated everything. I was physically, mentally, and financially 100% in. So at that point, I'm about 25 grand into the project. And I was had $2,000 I owed my brother and $6,000 I owed a credit union that I, that I, I borrowed money from for, with a car. And I had to make this work, right? So... I'm trying to make this product work. I get it up on Amazon around a black Friday, they start selling, you know, but I'm selling these things for $29.99 and they cost me $28 to make. Mm -hmm. And with Amazon's free shipping, I was losing about $12 every time I sold one. It was not a profitable venture for the first 100 that I made by hand. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I decided I needed to make this cheaper, right? So I started looking into manufacturing. I started looking into metal shops and I found this guy that was able to make a thousand brackets for me, but that was the minimum order quantity. Um, I was thinking, okay, a thousand brackets, 350 a piece, I'm out of money. How am I going to do this? So I got a job delivering pizzas for Domino's on a college campus at Dartmouth College and I was getting zero tips to the face and negative 28 degree weather, driving around in a beaten up Subaru, slinging pies for Domino's to raise some money to pay for a fitness product. And uh, after about six or seven months, I got the money to you know go forward with manufacturing. And I produced a product that cost me about 14 or $15 to make. And for the first time I had broken even on the products on the next 100 units. And so, um, 200 in, um, I'd lost money on the first hundred. I'm 35,000 debt. And I just broke even on the last 100 that I had sold. And I'm like, okay, we're getting closer. <laughs> I realized at the time that it was, it was a failure, but there was success in that failure. The product itself was selling. People liked it, but the problem was advertising and shipping cost. And I had no lifetime value of the customer, right? So I, I was paying 10 to $12 in advertising to sell a product for $30 that had 10 to $12 in profit in it. And after I shipped it, I lost money because nobody wants to pay for shipping. So I realized I needed more products if I was going to make this work. And around a year into it, I went online because I decided I need to sell a mat with my product, right? Mm -hmm. Sell the whole bundle. 
and I try to buy the uh, domain name abmat.com. Not never heard of the product before, never knew of the company. Um, I tried to buy abmat.com and it was taken. And my first, my first thought was, uh, who the hell has my damn domain? You know, I was pissed. Uh, I started looking it up and I looked up abmat.com and then all of a sudden a miracle happened. I just sat there and I stared at it because I saw this you know, this mat that had this ball, the natural contours of your spine and added the back support that was necessary for doing proper sit-ups. And I learned about this product and what they were doing. And I realized, man, these things go together really well. You know, one holds your feet down, the other one's got your back support. And it was like, it was like peanut butter and jelly, you know? <laughs> and I, I'm staring at this product and I go, I, it, it, it just dawned on me. I have to have my product sold and manufactured by these people because they had already been on, in row. I saw their distribution, they were everywhere, right? Uh, I went from never knowing about this product to just seeing it everywhere within a week. And so I made it, my new definite purpose was to license my product out to this company rather than you know trying to develop my own mat. And I found out who the owner of the company was, which was a guy named Kyle McCarter, who was currently, a, uh, who was a state senator of Illinois. And I was like, shit. How am I a 19 year old living in his aunt's basement who's 35 grand in debt going to get a senator on the phone? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, ironically enough, it's not that hard. <laughs> I, I, I thought back to what I knew about forming a business, right? And in, in the state that I was in, when I registered for my business license, I had to put a phone number down. So I was like, okay. So I called the state of Illinois and I got the business, uh, the documentation that he used to file for his business license. And there was a phone number. I'm like, I've never changed my phone number. You know, maybe he hasn't either. So I gave that a call and all of a sudden two, three rings in, he picks up and says, hello. I said, Senator McCarter? <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, Mr. McCarter, this is Dylan Tellum from Abamiga. How you doing, sir? And he said, good. We got on the phone, we talked, I presented my product to him. I told him what my ideas were and how they would fit together. And I said, uh, I said, give me an opportunity to fly out there and meet with you and show you who I am and what I'm about and demo my product. If you don't like it, don't ever call me back. Right. I said, all right, why don't you come out January 3rd, 2018. My son is coming into town and he's taking over the company for me. So I said, I'll be there. I got on a flight January 1st. I sat here in Lebanon, Illinois, two days early and prepped for the meeting. And um, I came in on January 3rd. I met with Austin McCarter and Kyle McCarter for the first time. And I presented my product to them. And it was it was a perfect fit. They, they wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to sell it first because they were a wholesaler, right? And Matt didn't have a, a direct consumer presence. We weren't you know, it was a, a single product company. So they said, all right, we'll take it if we can get some distribution for it. So they, uh, they set up another meeting um, at Rogue HQ, where I went out and met with their product development team. And um, I had tailored the product to look like a Rogue product, right? I used American steel, I used a, a natural woods, I printed on it with an American flag with a similar font. I wanted it to be taken by Rogue. Um, and at the and meeting, and so, so you're you're a 19 year old kid. You hadn't even heard of Abmat. What you, what led you to what kind of like research did you do, or what signs did you see as you were doing that that made you think you needed to impress Rogue? So when I was uh, before I'd uh, come across Abmat, I, I had looked into Rogue because I was trying to figure out some distributors to sell my products, and I knew that they were these giant behemoth of American made quality manufacturing. Um, here in the U.S., and it, I knew that they were one of the biggest, baddest players in the game already. And I had reached out to their product development team uh, to see about licensing it to them, and they said they were interested, uh, but uh, I didn't hear anything back for a little while, and it kind of went radio silence. And I got much more, you know, hyped up about the Abmat collaboration um, after I had gotten some good communication feedback with them, just because of the good pairing of the two products, right? Yeah, so I. Uh, I designed my product to look like a rogue product because I, you know, they're the biggest, the baddest and the best in the game. Why not? Um, so I made it my, per my definite purpose to license my product out and to get it into rogue. So 
we had this meeting over at Rogue. We met with the product developer over there and it went off well. And, uh, you know, he introduced me. He's like, oh, you're the App Amigo guy. He's like, yeah, we, we, we talked on LinkedIn or something. And uh, he said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And I was like, perfect. So we, they, we signed a licensing agreement for the product between Abmat and Abmat started manufacturing it here at this facility um, in Lebanon, Illinois, just outside of St. Louis. And we did our first order with them about two to three months later. And at that point in time, I'm kind of in like a, a, a gestation period, right? I just licensed my first fitness product didn't really have any other thing, anything else to do after I would license it because it was out of my control. And I went back to Miami and uh, I was uh, going to work back on boats. You know, I needed to get a job because I wasn't in depth with the fitness industry. I just licensed my product away. So I, I'm flying back from Vermont uh, to Miami and I flew out of Boston. And I kid you not, this is the strangest thing that could ever happen to me. Uh, two weeks before this, I had reached out because I was trying to find some more distributors for Abamigo, and I reached out to a company called Gronk Fitness, right? And mm -hmm. I got I got in touch with Rob Gronkowski's brother, Dan Gronkowski, who said simply, thanks for reaching out. We're not interested in taking on any new products. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I was like, okay, cool. I, I talked to a famous person. I'm happy with that. And I'm on this, uh, I'm at this airport, and I miss my first flight. They put me on standby for a second one. I didn't get on. They put me on standby for a third one. And I was like ninth on the list. And I'm like, I'm not getting on this flight. I finally go up to the lady at the desk and I said, listen, I need to get to Miami tonight. What do I need to do? So you can upgrade your ticket to a first class seat for 380 bucks. I said, I'll do it. Worth so, it. <laughs> yeah. So I upgrade my ticket. And as I'm sitting there at this airport, I see this giant dude in a blue sweater and an Atlanta Braves Falcons hat, or no, I'm sorry, Atlanta uh, Falcons hat. And uh, I just thought, okay, this is, a, he's a baseball player or something, you know, or a, a football player. I, I didn't know who it was. And I'm not real big into sports, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm just sitting there on this plane and I, this guy sits literally right in front of me in, in the seat, basically in my lap. And I see this mom and this girl walking by and I hear her say, mommy, mommy, he's right there. He's right there. And I'm going, I'm thinking, okay, well, it's, it's somebody that somebody cares about. I didn't know who. Uh, he puts down his sweater, his hoodie. And I went to the bathroom and as I was coming back, I got a good look at his face and I went, oh, I know who that is. It was Rob Gronkowski. And the only reason I knew that was because it was the Super Bowl had just occurred. I was living in New England at the time. And his house had gotten broken into. So they had the picture of his face over the audio recording uh, with 911 on the news like every day. It was this during the Super Bowl, right? It was, it was broken. Yeah, it was yeah. Yeah, during the Super Bowl. This well, was like, going on. Yeah. This was maybe two, three weeks later. You know, I guess maybe he was flying down to Miami to celebrate. Um, you know, he had a couple of great goose Probably. models on his, his tray already. But uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, what are the odds? You know, I get denied by Gronk Fitness two weeks earlier. I missed three or four flights. And here I am sitting with him in my lap right now. I'm like, I, I thought the, to myself, Dylan, if you don't say something, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. You know, so I, I'm on this plane for two and a half hours. And I finally worked up the courage. And I thought, all right, I'm going to let him go through his, his flight. And after I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. So the plane lands when I get up. And I'm standing right behind, beside him. And I look over at him. And I said, how's Gronk Fitness doing? <laughs> he said, no one's ever asked me that. I said, I'm right. Gonna... Yeah, no one's <laughs> probably ever asked him that. <laughs> he said, uh, I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know much about sports. And I said, and if you guys were playing in my front yard, I wouldn't bother to look out the window. And I said, but I was talking to your brother, Dan, a couple of weeks ago. He said, you know, Dan? I said, I said just through email. I, I I wanted, I reached out to him about a product I developed called the Abamigo. I'd love to make a custom Abamigo for Gronk Fitness. And I handed him a business card. He said, well, it's an Abamigo. I said, well, I'll turn the business card around. And so he turned it around and there was a, a picture of this uh, abdominal snowman, a fictitious Yeti <laughs> as my mascot using it underneath the door. And he said, oh man, that's pretty cool. You should reach out to Dan about that again. <laughs> I said, I will. 
he asked me for some directions. I think I gave him the wrong directions. I feel kind of bad about that, but uh, nonetheless, I got into my Uber or my Lyft afterwards, and I I fired off that email. Right, I'm like, hey Dan, I know this is weird, but I just sat next to your brother on a plane heading home from Boston, and it just seems a little strange to me. So I figured he told me to reach out. So I figured it was worth a shot. I want to send you an ab amigo. If you don't like it, don't ever call me. He messaged me back about 30 minutes later and he says, Dylan, your story checks out. Send it to this address. I was like, Sweet. we checked with his brother. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. What so, a story. Yeah. <laughs> and so I send him the product and about two or three days later, because I overnighted this thing, right? I get a phone call in the morning uh, around eight o'clock at night. I woke up to it literally. And I wake up, say, hello? And he says, Dylan, Dan Gronkowski, how you doing? I was like, very good, sir. How you doing? He's like, we want to carry the product and we'd like to, we worked out a deal where they managed our Amazon for that product. They've got the exclusive rights to sell it through their Amazon port portal. And uh, we started talking about some other products and they said, well, I, we really like this product, but we want to make a, a mini also and make it a little lighter. If you can get it under a pound, that'd be great because I could ship it anywhere in the country. for $3. All right. I said, okay, I got to cut you know, 75% of the weight of an Avamigo off of it somehow. So I developed this product, this, this mini, and I developed a wall mounted one and we started selling them through the Gronkowskis and uh, Austin and I started working a lot closer after that, because now not only had it just licensed one product, I was on my second and third. Yeah. Uh, so, so real quick, well, real quick, where are we in the timeline between late to between when you first started this and when we first met late in 2018 so you and i met after i had licensed my product to abmap okay so i okay i had already met the gronkowskis because i was i was in i was living in my apartment in coconut grove and so i was just simply running the ab amigo page trying to promote the product right because we didn't have any marketing plan we didn't have a direct consumer presence we didn't have anything like that so i was just trying to hype up the product a bit to help get some sales through through rogue and some of our other distributors okay. um, and were you were you were you making any money off of it right now no I, not really no 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 so i yeah. I, I, I was just starting to so i was getting royalties of, uh, off of each product sold but so yes, was I getting checks every three months? Absolutely. But I'm still $35,000 in a hole. So gotcha. a lot of checks to pay. That right. Out, right. It was a, uh, it's still a long journey on that, on that one particular. Yes. Okay. But um, so it did turn into a profitable venture for me because after we had made the second and the third products, right. I started working with other people and collaborating with them and I think we got up to like four or five products and I, uh, we were working really close to each with each other. And at one point in time, while I was down in Miami, uh, Shark Tank was coming to town, right? They were doing auditions for their new season. And I called Austin. I said, Hey man, I, I'm going to go take the ab and me go on to Shark Tank. You cool with that? And he's like, yeah, bring the ab map. I'm like, All right. So I went, I went to Shark Tank to pitch the ab and me go and ab map and I got through the auditions. Um, the guy was blown away. He's like, yeah, man, absolutely. So uh, so who, who are the auditions with? So the auditions are with like four just random people that are kind of like, I don't know, I'd, I'd assume it's like American Idol. You Somebody else hears you sing before you go see, you know, Randy Jackson. <laughs> but, gotcha. So just like some business minded people. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they're there. I think they're, they're producers, actually, that are there more for like, will this look good on TV? Um, right. Right. Uh, so I got through the auditions and we started this journey to go on to Shark Tank. It was like a six month process, hundreds of papers that we needed to fill out, a lot of questions, like four or five video interviews. And it was a very long process. We, it made us dive into the company immensely. We learned every aspect of it because of all these questions. And in the middle of this, this situation with we're about to get on to Shark Tank, Austin and I looked at each other and said, what happens if we get on, you know, how's this company work? Where do I stand at this? Am I still an inventor or getting royalties? What's the position here? Cause you know, uh, we didn't really have an idea for that. So at one point in time, 
Austin had called me and said, Hey, since you're working so well with me and, you know, we're building this thing together and it seems like we're both on the exact same path here. Why don't you trade in your royalties for an equity stake in the company? And I started thinking about it and I was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, it's what I was doing anyways. It's what I like to do. So we made an agreement. I became an equity owner in ABMAT in lieu of, of, of just an inventor getting royalties. And um, it was all because of the Shark Tank endeavor. And mm -hmm. We didn't end up going on the show. Um, we got to the last round and uh, they, they, said, they asked us if we'd be willing to wait till next year. We said, sure. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't end up going next year because we had figured it out ourselves, right? But it was these three strange events that kind of got me to where I am today. You know, it was, well, four, my dresser breaking, trying to buy the abmat.com website, meeting Rob Gronkowski on a plane, and then auditioning for Shark Tank, which kind of put me into the, the, the launch pad that I'm currently in now with abmat, which is, it's weird for me to even th say it out loud, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, before we get into what's going on today with Admat, uh, a few follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. um, so one, or you started creating this when you were just 19, which is mind blowing. Did you have like an entrepreneurial mind growing up? Were you always kind of tinkering with things? Most people don't just say, I'm going to go create something. So I, I, you got to remember, I didn't say I'm going to go create something. I made something to right. solve the problem, okay. from, right? I didn't, I didn't plan on turning it into a business, but I was desperate for some type of sign or direction in life because I had none. It was the first time in my life that I felt completely directionless. Um, and when my brother said, you should sell that, I took it as a sign, you know, and I just, I went all in on it. But uh, before Ab Amigo, my, I was really intertwined with my family business growing up, which was marine towing and salvage. So growing up, my dad owned a marine towing and salvage company. We would save boats and people that were sinking on fire, flipped over, crashed, run aground, out of fuel, whatever you name it. And uh, I was doing that and on boats and salvage boats since I was three. Um, captaining boats by the time I was 15 and going on salvages and rescuing people and boats and the whole nine yards. But uh, we had this, uh, business that I was supposed to take over when I turned 21. And when I was 17 or 18 in college, the business literally sank. Now, I don't mean figuratively, the, the whole business, which was on boats, sank underwater. Um, and there was a big turning point in my life because we had lost everything. Um, a friend of mine had died in the situation. Uh, and there was a lot of property damages that cost us everything houses, everything that we owned as a family were gone, which is why I ultimately ended up moving to Vermont, um, living in my aunt's basement because I didn't have anywhere to go. So when I was, you know, brought up my entire life with the idea that I'm going to be running the family business and I never considered anything else, you know, but I, in the marine towing and salvage industry, I learned an enormous about, about leverage, direction of force, force of motion, um, which made me, a, you know, the Ab Amigo is a lever, uh, essentially, when you think about it. So I, I had a good understanding of it uh, going into it. And last thing in the world I ever thought I'd be doing with my life is making fitness equipment. Matter of fact, I was watching Shark Tank six months before I made the Ab Amigo. And I saw this guy come out with us like, it was almost like a total gym, you know, a million things in one. And I was like, man, nothing in the world can do two things perfectly, not let alone a million. Right. And I decided right there. And then the only thing I know for sure, I don't want to do with my life is make a piece of fitness equipment. <laughs> I, I honestly think God's just having a little bit of fun with me, but I'm okay with it because it's been a, it's been a, a pretty cool ride to be honest. But, yeah. That is wild story. That's one reason why I asked because you're definitely a, a smart, a smart guy. It seemed like you'd just be, in college as a typical 19 year old doing the normal college things like do it going to an engineering school the way your mind is wired i'm i'm that's what i would think about um okay so you, so you had tragedy at a young age um completely turned your life upside down you moved to vermont from yeah. sunny florida yeah um you're living in your aunt's basement or an apartment or 
probably moving back and forth. It sounds like a couple different places you were lived there. Um, and you create this ab amigo and quickly go all in. Yes. You're like 12 hours <laughs> <laughs> all in. <laughs> yeah. You quickly go all in You're you pretty much collect the college debt within on this product. So that's kind of your, your education. Yes. Um, and no. I didn't, I didn't acquire a liability. I acquired an asset. So I, that's the way okay, I look yeah, at it. Yeah. I, I, when I was, I was in high school when uh, my parents' business literally went underwater. So I had to drop out of high school. I dropped out of high school and I went to college for a couple semesters in Tallahassee. And I realized, man, I'm just going into debt and I'm not learning anything that I didn't learn in high school already. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And I, I, I saw the, I saw the racket, right? I saw a hundred thousand dollars in student loans that I'd have to pay back before I can actually go off and do something on my own. And I thought, okay, well, that's going to put me into a job. I'm going to get responsibilities and liabilities within that time. Maybe I meet somebody, have some kids, get a dog. Next thing you know, I'm 35, 40 years old, and I'm still working a nine to five and never did the thing that I always wanted to do uh, because I spent so much time paying back a debt that I didn't want to acquire in the first place. So that's the way I looked at it, you know, and I thought if I'm going to be spending $35,000 I might as well do it onto something that I truly believe in. And if it doesn't work out, by all means, I'll go to school afterwards, you know? But uh, so, yeah, that was, that, that was my college tuition, if you will. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it, the, the, it's difficult to do at 19. I'm wondering if it's more difficult, let's say you're 35 and have a family. 100%. Um, there's two different, two different kind of uh, evils trying to create something from scratch. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that later um, because I have some questions as to what you're doing with Abmat these days that I think can help a lot of different people. So you are, let's go back to the story, um, back in the timeline, you are in Florida, you've decided that you're going to be, um, an, you're a, an equity owner and I guess employee with Abmat. What, where's your mind at now where you're still in Florida, um, you're still separate from Southeast I, Illinois, right? Uh, or, I, oh, no, I've never looked at a map. South, <laughs> Southern Illinois, um, near Missouri. So yeah, what's going on there? I'm working um, as a product developer from home, right? So okay. I'm, I'm developing things uh, from my, my apartment in Coconut Grove, uh, working with people, collaborating with people like you and um, basically doing whatever I felt like doing. Uh, I wasn't necessarily a full-time employee. Actually, I wasn't an employee at all. Um, you know, I had a small thousand dollar a month budget that I was given for all of the materials and product development stuff that I needed. And okay. about 75% of that was actually allocated towards, uh, just sponsoring some Instagram posts just to help get our following up. And at one point in time, while I'm down there, I realized, okay, I'm still pushing Ab Amigo when we're a lot more than that now, you know? So, and AbMat had acquired Ab Amigo. So I started off as really just with, you know, I was doing product development just for fun, but I became the social media director of AbMat. I, yeah. I ended up buying the domain name Abraham, uh, from Abraham Matthew, who had the AbMat domain uh, for uh, the username. Um, Oh. He, 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 gotcha. him, he, won, he was like 20,000. I was like, geez. And I was like, 20,000 what? He's like rupees. I was like, oh, cool. What is that? Like 300 bucks? He was like, yeah. I was like, perfect. Oh, was he different. wasn't in, he wasn't in this country? No, no, no. And uh, so I, I buy this username from him and I start growing our social media and working and collaborating with people like yourself. And um, I started developing some more con connections and communications with some big players. And Eventually, some of them started reaching out with product development ideas, things that they wanted us to build, uh, and we started making some more things. And at the time, I was working for this billionaire down in Miami, managing his yacht for him. Um, I sat on his $6 million boat every day for 40 hours a week and made sure it was functioning and clean and everything, whole nine yards. And for two months out of the year, I traveled the Bahamas with him and uh, made sure his, his trip went well. And... 
I was had a lot of time so that I can hop on the phone and uh, talk to Austin and work some things okay. out and, and build the brand and the business model. And when the pandemic hit, my life changed like so many others, you know, and I, I, for me, I feel selfish because it was a very good opportunity for me as it was for a lot of people in the fitness industry. But I, I hate the fact that it was due to other people's misfortunes, right? A, a worldwide pandemic. But Austin called me at one point in time while I was sitting on the boat and he said, Dylan, I need you to come out here. I said, for what? He said, I, I need you to move here and do this full time. And I said, why? He said, we are 10,000 ab mats on back order. I said, whoa. Had, had you guys talked about that before or was this just out of the blue? I, I had mentioned it in, in, in fleeting conversations because every single day I was living an absolute dream job. And the only thing I wanted to do to was move to St. Louis and make fitness equipment. You know, it, it made absolutely no logical sense whatsoever, but every bone in my body was telling me I was still doing the wrong thing. So I had mentioned it and we, it, it was just this opportunity that popped up and I said, when do you need me? He said, tomorrow. I said, okay. I went to my employer. I said, Bruno, I need to head out. Um, and I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. He said, no, you're leaving in two weeks. I said, yeah, I'm leaving in two weeks. So, <laughs> so I left in two weeks after I had found a replacement and I've been here for about a year and eight months maybe. But in the time that we've been here, we've, we've been growing exponentially. Um, and I'm, and I'm really, really, really excited for what AppMat has turned into and what it's going to become. Right. So AppMat is no longer a one trick pony. No. Um, can you can you tell us kind of the key initiatives uh, going on with AbMat today, or and just give a maybe actually um, rather than key initiatives, um, talk about how AbMat has evolved since you've moved up there. So when I came out here, AbMat was a contract manufacturing company, right? We manufactured about seven or eight different products. Uh, one was fitness related, which was the AbMat, and we had. Uh, uh, a couple of other products and we'd had some military uh, subcontracts that we did uh, sewing bags and whatnot. And gotcha. Long story short, we looked at the business model and it wasn't, didn't have a lot of security. You know, when we're, you're building products for other people, they can pull those contracts or go find somewhere else or move to China. You know, there's a million things that could happen. Um, and you have to be insanely price competitive in order to maintain those contracts or somebody else will, will beat you up, you know? Mm -hmm. So we took a look at our business model and we realized two things. One, we need to own what we're doing in order to be able to do it properly. So we, we bought the AbMat trademark from the original inventor of the AbMat, Nick Fred Koch. And so we owned the rights to it. So it couldn't be pulled from out under our feet. Uh, we, and started consolidating some of our, our pieces of fitness equipment and ideas under the same brand, AbMat, you know, to help eliminate the uh, needs to market for different pro products and companies, right? Uh, and we started eliminating some of the other things that we did slowly. Every time we got a new fitness product, we eliminated something else that we made for somebody else. So we could focus on our own destiny, right? And we realized that our greatest success was recognizing my failure which was the inability to sell a single piece of fitness equipment profitably in the modern landscape. You know, if I, if I made the Ab Amigo in the 1990s, I would have been a, a seen on TV millionaire, right? But those things didn't exist anymore. People don't have cable. People don't have, uh, sports authorities are gone off the face of the earth and Dick Sporting Goods sells only their own branded stuff. And, uh, you know, Dwayne Johnson sneakers. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> We there was no place to sell fitness equipment anymore except for online, and the shipping of fitness equipment is astronomical because these are all heavy things. You know, I, I find it so counterintuitive with like fitness equipment because the reason why Home Depot is so successful is because you can't mail a two by four profitably. But you know, these racks aren't too much different; they're just the same size and lengths, but they're heavier. You know, so I was like, why do these things not exist? But nonetheless, we started looking into the single product companies that were out there and I started calling them up and I told them my story and said, 
told, showed them how I showed them how I failed and why I kept going. And uh, they would listen to my story and they'd say, yeah, I'm in the exact same boat. I said, really? I said, yeah. I said, uh, you know, if, would you give me six months of an, an opportunity for six months? If I can't make you more money than you're currently making and relieve a lot of the work and effort that you have to put into it, then, you know, we'll, we'll tear up the contract. And if we're ever in the same state, I'll buy you dinner and shake your hand. And maybe we can do this again sometime. Everyone said, yes, people were allowing us to represent their products, manufacture it here in the United States, rather than China, um, and carry their product through the life cycle of, uh, you know, through product development, all the way to end distribution and fulfillment and customer service. Can you, um, can you give a few examples? So I think the first one was the hip thrust pad. Um, you know, so the hip thrust pad was invented by a gentleman named Devin Grell, who solved it to fit his own needs, but he was, you know, flipping houses out in Phoenix, Arizona. So he had, this was a side project for him, right? So I recognize the minds of most inventors because a lot of people in the industry, they didn't do this to stop their nine to five job and to become a millionaire off of a product. They created this product because one, they needed it for themselves and it solved their problems. And two, the mindset of an inventor will make it so that it will bother you for the rest of your life if you don't see this product with your own two eyes. Existing in your head will manifest in there until it becomes an obsession. And once it becomes an obsession, you can go crazy until you see that with your own two hands and you could show it to somebody else and they said, yeah, I get it. That's a good idea, Dylan, or good idea, Devin. Um, so I would talk to these people and we'd find commonality and I'd tell them what I do and how I do it. And my business model is different than anybody else's. We're based off of collaboration, not competition. So I don't make barbells, weights, racks, plates, or dumbbells because that's what the fitness companies are comprised of. All the accessories is the other things that they sell just to help support their brands, right? Just add-ons. So by not competing with them on the core products, I'm able to sell to all of them. So I'm, I have a much larger distribution network than most companies. Um, and the fact that we make and control everything here in the United States means that we have you know, full control of our product pipeline. We have our own product development team here. So we have a lot to offer these people in terms of improving upon their products and quickly bringing them to market because of our infrastructure that's built up. So our business is more of a platform, if you will. It's a platform for the single product inventors who develop something that changes the course of how we view fitness or a specific product or genre within the industry and giving them the opportunity to scale their product and make money off the things that they did rather than the things that they do. So the I'm, I'm sick and tired of the idea of single monolithic brands and companies, right? These brands and companies that come in and believe that the only way for me to succeed is to destroy everybody else. In certain industries and aspects, it makes sense, like social media, right? It makes more sense if everybody's on Facebook than there's 20 different social media platforms because you're all connected then. Yeah. But in the health and wellness and fitness industry, I think it's atrocious. Everybody should, there should be as much innovators and collaborators going on and developing as many products as possible to solve needs because it's all about the betterment of mankind through health and wellness, right? So it's ignorant to say this company is the best company out there because as a, someone who reviews equipment, I can assure you, you don't believe one company has the best products on all classes and lines, right? Some companies have the best bench, some have the best barbell, some have the best plates, some have the best accessories, whatever it is, no company is best across the board. So I think that pulling some of the greatest innovators and product developers from around the world and consolidating us into a single developer uh, development platform to launch these products out to solve as many needs as possible within the industry that are unique, novel, and innovative through collaboration is something that this industry has been drastically missing, um, missing the boat on. So that's pretty much our business model to consolidate other brands and to represent them under a single name, but while keeping their own unique aspects alive, right? So I, I want products to live on longer than the inventors do. And I want them to make money off of it for as long as we're selling the product. So our royalty agreements aren't based off of the life of a patent. They're not based off of a time frame, other than for as long as we're selling the product, you're going to make money off of the idea that you brought to the table for us. So we're, we're honest. We tell people exactly what we're going to make off of their product, exactly how much they're going to make. 
Um, we don't overpromise and under deliver. We're just, I believe in transparency and honesty and building a platform that allows everybody to have an opportunity. And that, that's what I want to do at AppMath to represent the inventors, essentially. That's very cool. Uh, how many products do you have now? I don't know. Um, I get that asked a lot. Um, we have like 40 SKUs on our website. So I, I don't know. It, it's constantly changing. Probably 30. Yeah. I well, think, I think we sell like 20 through distributors. And then we have like, another half uh, another dozen that our distributors have not picked up yet it's just fascinating how you the only reason that you've gotten to where you are and admet has transformed into what it is is because of what you went through as an inventor yeah um i knew the pain points you know so it's an easy conversation for me to have because i've lived it right it's very interesting because if AbMat would have been invented 10 years ago, how many more niche products would we have available today? Or if, if this if sort of this sort of uh, collaboration was available? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, really, to be honest, but uh, you know the AbMat when it was created, it, it grew up exponentially just by pure dumb luck by itself. Ray Glassman adopted it, put it in the first CrossFit gym ever. And he went, ironically went from one gym to 13,000 worldwide within less than 20 years. So, you know, every single one of those gyms buys 10 to 30 ab mats. And there's, you know, the ab mats of a synonymous name with CrossFit. You know, it, it's, uh, it grew through the CrossFit community, but now it's branching into powerlifting and garage gym uh, community. And it, it's become more, more more immersive right because mm -hmm. we're, we're bridging the gap between training methodologies and the equipment so if you go through our website you don't see power lifting crossfit bodybuilding equipment you see strength conditioning recovery right mm -hmm. because we're all doing the same thing we're working out right how you're doing it that's entirely up to you uh but equipment's not single-faced so we're we're, right. try, we're trying to bridge the gap between the, the markets of the industry and expand upon the uh, offering that we have. So what are the characteristics you like to see in the people that you want to work with? Great question. Um, I can care less about your product. And I don't, that's not entirely true, but I, I what I, I, first off, if your product, if I like it, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you, right? It's kind of like, any relationship that you would ever form in your life, like a girlfriend, right? The first thing that you see is, are you attracted to them or not? Yeah. <laughs> but then you have to get to know their personality, right? I do not do business with people that I don't want to do business with. If somebody has a good product, I will call them and talk to them. And if I like the conversation and they seem like an affable person and they're willing and capable of working and collaborating with others, um, then at that point in time, I would form a business relationship. I don't care as much. I don't invest in products. I invest in people, right? A lot of companies do the exact opposite. They'll steal one person's product and then try to justify it online when I'd rather collaborate with the inventor because the person who creates one product is much more likely to make a second, third, fourth, and fifth than just a random roll of the dice of people in the street, right? So there's a longer lifetime value of an inventor than a single product. So I'd like to develop a relationship that is on the foundation of exactly that, a good relationship. Um, so by investing into people, we've seen a, a, an astronomical amount of growth because these inventors who are so prolific and have now have an opportunity to just say, hey, here's my idea, not here's my product that I spent $250,000 developing in a patent and all this years, all these many years of hard work. They can call me up and say, here's my idea. Let's do it again. And so we build another product together. Um, it, it, it's much more compounding in terms of innovation. And all these people have friends that know about their success in licensing a product to Abmat. And a lot of them yeah. will refer me to other products and developers and send people our way. So it, it, it's a compounding way of getting an innovative pipeline uh, to continually produce uh, unique accessories. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. I think that's, um, I mean, just like considering you yourself, your first product was the Ab Amigo, 
I don't think like, like it's a very good idea, but I don't think that's making anybody rich. It's a great start. And then you have evolved into creating a a number of other great things. Um, And so I think if there are plenty of other people who just want, or if if you want to meet a number of other Dylans, um, you're going to listen to their B minus work as long as they're bringing some sort of good attitude and creative thinking and um, just, you know, the, the characteristics you mentioned. Not, not everybody's first product is their best, <laughs> but it, it's yeah. a good indicator. If it catches your eye, it means they have the ability to do something of the sort. And I, I utilize our inventors, right? And all of our, the people that we partner with. So when we're developing a product, like our box squat pad, I call up Donnie Thompson, who has, you know, one of the heaviest squats ever recorded in human history. And I asked him to try the product and test out the density. And he gives me his feedback, right? So we, we're not only just collaborating on individual products, we're a guild. The AdMAD Guild of Inventors is, is alive and well, and we're all benefiting each other by creating more innovative accessories that we can all train with, you know? So it's- it, Exactly. It's an, a great strategy as, as if you can get one person adding your product there and they're sending their followers and the people they know to your website, they're going to also see the other products that other inventors or AdMat has created. So exactly. people yeah. don't, people don't look for AdMats. They discover AdMat, right? So mm-hmm. when people go to our website, they don't buy one thing. They buy three, you know, and they're always random. Like, Oh, I bought a preacher pad. I bought barbell pills and I bought sled spacers. You know, these yeah. are all three problems that I've seen. And that, then they become a, a, an instant fan because they don't go to other companies and see all these little micro solutions to these tiny little niche problems that they're faced with in a gym. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've also, you've discussed a lot of, of pros to American manufacturing. What are some of the difficult things that you're dealing with today as an American manufacturer, manufacturer competing against everybody else? So I, there's a lot of, so it, it's weird for me because I'm probably the only product developer in for a, a medium sized company in the United States in the fitness industry that also manages our social media still. So I see all the comments on my work, you know, it's like, I don't know if Justin Bieber writes a song and then spends the next six months reading the YouTube comments. It could be very, very depressing <laughs> uh, to hear everybody's critiques in my work, but I will never stop doing it because it allows me to learn what the other problems are that people are faced with the other thoughts that people have and no products that abmat are ever done you know they're constantly evolving and improving upon uh customer feedback so i i monitor it very closely but in terms of american-made manufacturing um i get a lot of people that are used to like aldi and trader joe's prices you know that will look at one of our products and go wow I'm not paying that much for this. I can make it for 25. I'm like, I make thousands of them at a time and it costs me 80. You know, I, if you can make me, I, sometimes I'll respond to them. Like uh, I'm sending you over a PO and your DMs for a thousand units at $25 a piece. Let me know when they're finished. You know, uh-huh. um, people have a very misconstrued conception of what things truly cost. And, you know, so they'll look at some of our products and go, oh, well, that's just foam wrapped in vinyl. You know, uh-huh. I can make that myself. I'm like, that foam piece is $60. It's a really high density, high grade American made foam. And that vinyl is 13 bucks a yard, you know, good luck, dude. But yeah, I see comments like that all of the time. And I'm also thinking, okay, that product is $60. It'll take you five hours to make. How much do you value your time? Is it really only $12 an hour or so? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. To have a slap shot, do it yourself project. But, you know, and I love it when people are like, oh, no, I'm not buying that. Uh, I'll be like, okay, well, you could buy it somewhere else. Oh, wait, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah. Probably- I, I will say the, the, like, the Jim Hardos are the loudest on the internet. So they're the ones that are going to nitpick the things that make that may sound like that that make your life in the gym easier but may sound like you're a sissy like the barbell pillows like (laughs) oh who cares if your bar gets beat up a little bit you know 
stuff like that. Primarily CrossFit gyms that have 60 of them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, it's a value thing. Wait, those barbell pillows are one of our biggest sellers. We, I think we've sold 10,000 of those things. It's, um, they're absolutely great for a home gym, you know, and, and, and especially for commercial facilities, it's a very cheap accessory. And we just use it basically as a way to an acquire a customer so we can sell them something on an email eventually or our next product drop. And uh, we have a very high engagement between our emails and all of our social media marketing because people know we're constantly dropping new things that mm -hmm. no one has ever seen before. So it's not mm -hmm. just like, hey, here's our newest, you know, adjustable bench. It's, hey, here's something that you've never seen before that's going to solve that problem that you've, that's been bugging you, but you never really thought about too much. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's cool. American made manufacturing in my eye has always been the way to go. You know, could we make an astronomical amount more money if we switch to a Chinese manufacturer, maybe a couple of years ago before shipping rates and uh, everything got so, you know, bumped up due to this pandemic, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not our business model we yeah. make things here. We got, you know, 20 something employees here that are manufacturing on a daily basis that you know, are reliant upon what we build here and what we produce, you know, to feed their families and build their homes. And um, I believe in American made manufacturing. I've seen mm -hmm. my grandfather who was a machinist who lost his job to Chinese companies. And I heard him complaining about it his entire life. And, um, mm -hmm. We we couldn't do that, you know, right. morally, just because of who we are and what we believe in. But American made manufacturing does make sense, especially for accessories. You know, when we're doing large volumes of foam, it doesn't make sense to fill up a container of foam and ship it across the planet to save 20 cents yeah. you know, on every dollar. But yes, sort, sort of sort of on that topic, um, you mentioned there are certain products that you can only get through the AdMat website, but there are a decent amount of products that are very similar to what you guys offer, primarily the AdMat um, that are imported from overseas. Yes. Um, that a number of other companies do sell. Oh. Um, what what would be your sales pitch to be to one of those larger companies that are selling quite a bit um, of those kind of products for a little bit cheaper of a price to just switch to the the American made AvMap or a similar product to that? So I don't uh, having some company knock off my product does uh, the AvMap in particular uh, does not bother me. It actually, it's a great indicator because it tells me exactly who I need to call next, uh, you know, and try to form a relationship with. So the AdMat in particular, um, a lot of people knocked it off because it was a necessary accessory for CrossFit and all these different companies that were coming in trying to compete in the CrossFit space. Uh, they needed to have an option, right? Some of them who were importers just stuck with importing. Some of them contacted us and said, hey, can you custom label these for me? Um, and we, we did. And my sales pitch is primarily on value, right? So you make your money and your business is built on your racks, weights, plates, barbells, and dumbbells. And every single company has a, a, a unique selling proposition. You know, do you want the best and the greatest? Do you want the cheapest and the most affordable? Do you want the, the biggest value added option between the two? Um, and there's companies that have been built around these very minute differences. Don't sell the knockoff products. If you sell knockoff accessories, you're cheapening the value of your brand. By adopting the actual American-made core products, not only are you, do you have the ability to sell all AbMat products that will increase the innovation and perceived value of your brands, selling an American-made accessory and then selling your value-added option for the core products increases the perceived value of your brands, right? So one of the reasons why I love Rogue Fitness so much is it doesn't matter what door you walk into in any of their facilities. The first thing you see on the wall is what you allow in your presence becomes your standard. And they truly, truly, truly believe that. If you allow knockoffs and cheap accessories that break down or don't fit the bill just to, in order to save $5 by importing it from China or Taiwan or Hungary or wherever you're getting it from, what is that doing to the overall value of your brand? If you're doing $100 million a year in sales and just you're making an extra 20 grand a year and selling a knockoff ad mat, imagine what your, the perceived value of your brand would be if you started selling the name goods, you know? And it's, it's not just about selling the name good ad mat, right? A relationship with our brand is a continual drop every single month of a new product that you can sell to your customers. 
you know, that is innovative and collaborative. And it shows that you're not, you're not a snake in the grass, just trying to steal other people's ideas, right? You're, you're hungry to work with the community and you actually listen and care about the community. So I don't think I have a sales pitch to be honest to these other companies. Cause I don't reach out to them a lot. Some of them will reach out to me and they come to this conclusion on their own, but I'm, we're going to keep doing what we're doing at Admat, you know, through honesty, transparency, and collaboration. And I think it's ultimately going to prevail as uh, the go-to source for innovative fitness accessories. You know, I thought that was a pretty good pitch. Um, I mean, that would I, that makes total sense to me. Um, I can't imagine a lot of these companies making a huge amount of profits from these accessory products, anyways. So a switch to an American-made manufacturer for at least this makes sense to me. Switching it up a little bit. And just a few more questions, um, but just as a developer in this space, I'd love to just ask you a few um, questions about the industry. Um, so just number one, um, since you have, I guess, since you've started the Abamigo, how have you seen the industry change? And take this where, wherever you'd like, you don't have to so when the industry was just, when I first got into it, obviously I was still very nascent to the whole layout of everything. So I was still learning what the industry was. So I couldn't declare it as one thing at this time, but during the pandemic, I saw the largest change. I saw for the first time gyms close on a massive scale and people were rushing to, you know, buy fitness equipment like it was the California gold rush to build and develop their own home gyms. They started with a lot of the accessories that we sell because you know most people weren't planning on buying a full rack, weights, barbell set. They just wanted something to keep busy. So they'd buy ab mats and medicine balls and you know jump boxes and whatnot. But um, what I've seen in this industry is rampant growth um, and huge amounts of innovation coming from all walks of life in every single corner of the globe. And that's what I've been paying attention to the most. The, industry is still very young. You know, we didn't have the first full gym in the United States until the 1940s. No one knew what a gymnasium was, you know, so to go from 60, 80 years of, you know, actually working out and developing fitness equipment, um, the, the world has changed in terms of information basis, right? Up until the 90s, we saw people focusing like on how big can people possibly get Mr. Olympia was big. Arnold was big. He was in every single movie that you can imagine. And people were focused on that bodybuilder uh, type kind of style of training. And then we saw a huge change in the early 2000s as the CrossFit cult kind of grew. Um, and out of that, we saw a bigger rise in, in powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting and other training denominations. And I think the rise of the home gym has been one of the most astronomically rampant growth sectors of the fitness industry. Um, but in terms of where I see the industry going, right now we're in a unique gestation period where we spend most of our lives in the real world, but we observe it through a screen. And I think a lot of people are more self-conscious about how they look and they care more about the perceived depiction of how they appear to their friends. So a lot of people are getting into fitness because they wanna look better in an Instagram post. Um, you know, and they, they want to feel better about themselves. And if, and the, the, the bar is being raised by their friends, you know, so, you know, if you go down Miami, you got incredibly fit people all around you. You didn't have that in the fifties, you know, I, not that I was around, but I, 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 I I've seen pictures, Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think that the fitness industry is going to continue to grow, not indefinitely. Um, I think we're in a stage where we're spending, we're still exist in the real world, but we stare at a screen. So people are trying to improve the way they look. I think there's going to be a huge push towards home fitness. Um, I think the garage gym is going to have some astronomical growth for the next five, 10, 15 years. I do believe that there's going to be a larger push towards technology driven training equipment, such as the mirror, the Peloton, uh, tonal, uh, all these different things that you're seeing. Um, that can convey information and training routines uh, while simultaneously providing you with the equipment to do these necessary workouts. Um, I see a huge transition into the material science of how products are produced. You know, this, this is a medicine ball from 1920. 
it looks very similar to the one that you would have bought in 19 uh, in 2019 until we made the foam, first foam molded medicine ball that will never ever bust you know i i don't see people making leather medicine balls in 10 years i don't see them making uh, plyometric boxes out of wood with sharp 90 degree angles um you know i don't see them making ab mats out of leather and vinyl it's all going to be foam molded um so I, I see a huge change of how we produce products um, in terms of wear and tear and longevity. And I think ultimately um, the fitness industry is going to grow until, I don't know, until we all live 90% of our lives in a virtual reality world. <laughs> At that point, no one's going to care what they look like, just what their avatar is dressed as, you know? Yeah. Hope, yeah. hopefully, hopefully that's a little longer away than uh, Facebook seems to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you, you knocked out my follow-up question, which was, where do you see the industry heading? Um, how about AbMat in five years? Where would you like to see AbMat? I'd like the industry to know what we are, who we are, and what we do. Um, you know, I've always known our business model. Austin's always known our business model. You have but we've just started marketing and sharing our experiences with the world and people are finally starting to get it. You know, they're, start, they're starting to understand who and what AbMat is. I would like to, my, my metrics of, of success are two things. What kind of people, how many people can we help bring products to market and how much money can we make our inventors? You know, we got a, we got a board outside that has a running tally of how much money we've paid out in royalties and, Rather than you know being upset when we're writing very large checks to inventors like some companies are for their royalties, we get excited. We ring a little bell and we dry erase, rub it off, and add, yeah. add it to the total. You know, I I'd like to be paying out a million dollars a year uh, to inventors so that you know people know that this is a surefire platform and way that you can develop a product with honesty and integrity and have trust in the company that you're working with and know that you're going to get get what you deserve. You know, I'd like to add some integrity to the industry and right some wrongs, um, you know, eliminate some of the knockoffs that are destroying single mom and pop companies and small innovators from producing more products because of the um, increase of competition. And I'd like to give credit where credit is due. I want every inventor of every single product to be listed in every description across every single company's uh, description of that product indefinitely. You know, um, I, I, I've asked Donnie Thompson at one point in time, I said, what means more to you, the credit or the money? So mm -hmm. the credit, 100%. Yeah. I, I say, is it too much to ask for both? So, um, and I don't think it is. So I want to see AbMat affect as many lives as possible. You know, I, I care about our consumers deeply because every time they buy a product, it allows us to fund another project, right? So, right. I, I, I want to continue to improve upon the fitness industry and, and see our products and collaborate with as many people as possible. So. Okay. Lastly, if somebody has a product idea, what would be the steps that they need to do before they come, they come to you with their idea? And in an ideal world, how far along in the pro basically how far along in the process would you like them to be? So there's no project that I've ever worked on is similar to another. Each deal, each product, each collaboration has been 100% unique. So there's no single answer to that. I will take your call, whether you have an idea that you had that morning in the gym at your, during your workout, or if you've been working on something for eight years and you're a half a million dollars into it, um, because both of them can outline a problem, right? I have no problem with making solutions to problems my biggest problem is finding and discovering more problems so if somebody calls me and brings one to me i'm already further along than i expected to be that day so um you know the job of a product developer is very similar to a writer once you establish yourself as a writer people bring stories to you so to have conversations like this with you it gets out there and people hey say i have an idea i'd like to reach out to abmat i'm not hard to find I make it a mission to make sure that I'm very easy to approach. You know, if you ever see me in the street, you can talk to me about these things, but I am the one who runs our social media. You can simply DM me. My email and, and cell phone number is listed on our website under the exact words, product development ideas. Yeah. Give me a call. You know, I, uh -huh. I can't make it any easier to contact me. And uh, my, my phone will 
I'll answer it if I'm awake, um, which is usually till one o'clock in the morning, Central Standard Time, if you're on the East Coast. But uh, um, in terms of how I'd like to see the products presented, present the problem, show the solution, right? So obviously the deal that we end up ultimately coming to in terms of your financial uh, or your monetary kickback is going to be dependent upon how far along you are. If you bring me a patented product as already developed, already in manufacturing and you sold 300 of them, uh, but you're in the same position that I was in where you're just losing money hand over fist every time you do it, Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay you a lot more for that product because it's patent protected. You probably have a couple hundred grand into it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's, it's turnkey for me. All I got to do is assume the manufacturing responsibility, change up anything that I need to do, do my due diligence and launch it. Right. Um, if someone came to me with an idea or, or problem, just a problem, but not an idea of how to solve it, I still pay out royalties on some of these things, uh, depending on if it was unique or novel or not. Um, Dr. Travis Fleming, a chiropractor out here, came to me and said, hey, you know what? No one can massage their own back with a hypervolt. They come to me to have them do it for 20, 30 minutes, and I charge them 90 bucks an hour or whatever it is. Uh -huh. uh, we, he came up with a couple of ideas of how to attach it to a barbell, and I started looking at it, and we decided to develop the massage gun holder. I pay him out of royalty for bringing the problem to me. And he helped develop the product with us and he helped develop the second iteration, which is a magnetic massage gun holder that mounts to a, a power rack, um, which we'll be launching here really shortly. And so I take con cool. calls from all walks of life in all different stages, but you know, you're going to make more if you have more into it and you've invested more time, money, or, um, you know, thought into a product than you would if it was just a nascent idea. Cause I got to do more work when it's just an idea. I still got to develop the solution and build the product and market it, you know? So it, it, it's all, I'll, I'll take any call, but your, your kickback is dependent upon you and how far you take it first. Makes sense. All right. Um, and anything else you want to add Dylan while you're here? nothing other than it's been an absolute pleasure to be on your your podcast man i love being the fact that i'm your first interview I, you and i have been you know growing in this industry since 2018 and it all started with the trade of a flag for an <laughs> that that is it's pretty cool i tell me what happens three years later you'd be happy with it yeah um one of those weird happenstance circumstances that you just kind of fall into and just i I, I, that's what I, one of the things I love about this industry, man. It's about people that are work, willing to collaborate to build upon and share information and data and analytics and ideas and, and innovations to you know help improve the community. So um, it's an, it's a true honor to be a part of it, and I'm excited for what the future holds. And if you're listening to this and you've got an idea, give me a call. Let's get it going. Awesome. Well, let's close it out. Cool, cool story. Um, awesome projects you're currently working on and i think the future is bright for you and abmat so appreciate you taking the time to hop on the call hey thanks for having me man